Hi, this is Jonathan Gardner. In this video, we're covering section 1.3 of Schroeder's An Introduction to Thermal Physics. And this section covers the equic partition of energy. So if we refer back to the last section, we had equation 117 that talks about how the kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy was split up between three different axes. And so we had one half mv in the x direction squared, and that's the average. We had one half mv in the y direction squared, averaged and then one half mv in the z direction squared averaged. And we realize that each of these gives you one half kT. So the temperature manifests itself by tripling the amount of kinetic, the average kinetic energy because of each of the different directions that it could be rotating. So for a total energy of three halves kT. Okay. So we, we kind of had a sense of why the energy was dividing itself up in that way. We determined that there was no, like the direction of the molecules were all random, right? They could be going in any direction. And uh, of course they would bounce around a lot, but in each of those directions, the velocity wouldn't change because of the elastic nature of the collisions that were occurring with the boundaries. And we didn't consider how the atoms were, or how the molecules were colliding with, it, with each other. We just imagined they were passing right through them, right? Well, there's other places that can store energy too. For instance, we can have one half I omega squared, where we have the moment of inertia here and we have the rotational velocity of the molecule or whatever. There's energy that can be stored there. We also have one half uh, Kx squared, where if we have some kind of spring, this would be how the displacement of the spring, the potential energy in the spring or whatnot, okay? What the equipartition theorem says is it says at temperature T, the average energy of any, quad, any quadratic degree of freedom is one half kT. Okay, let's look a little bit at what that means. So we have temperature T of whatever it is. It could be a gas, it could be a liquid or whatnot the average energy of any quadratic degree of freedom. So these are degrees of freedom that have a square here, okay? So there's a square there, and these guys have squares as well. So when there is a square on something, then it's going to have one half kT, okay? So the temperature is, when you increase the temperature, each of these is gonna see an increase in their energy. Okay, what do we mean, what do we mean by degree of freedom? Well, this isn't really something that's I guess it is well-defined, but it's not something that you can intuitively grasp very early on, okay? So each of these is a degree of freedom, an area where energy could be like cached away, it could be put. If we allowed the molecules to spin, we'd have to think of all the different um, axes they can spin around and then assign a degree of freedom for that. And then for springs, we'd have to actually think of two different ways that the springs could store energy. So there's actually two times here. One comes from the kinetic energy of the spring, and the other comes from the potential energy of the spring. Which, if you've done basic physics, you know that when you have a spring motion, you have this oscillation due to the spring, the energy will shift between being stored in potential energy and being stored in kinetic energy. Okay. Uh, to being more specific here, let's say we had, you know, uh, a spring fixed and there's a mass here where this is the, the standard length of the spring. When that thing is oscillating, when it's at an extreme here, so when it's all the way out here or all the way out here in these directions, so when it's reached those positions, then the potential energy is maximized, the kinetic energy is zero. And as it passes through the center, the potential energy is zero and the kinetic energy is maximized. And we discovered, you know, through math that those two energies must total the same. Right, so there's actually two degrees of freedom for each degree of vibration that you can have in the molecule. When you have a system with n particles and f degrees of freedom for each particle, the total thermal energy is going to be n times f times one half kT. Okay, so all of that thermal energy is gonna split between each of the particles, each of their degrees of freedom, and they're each gonna have one half kT. Okay, we'll prove the equipartition theorem in chapter six. However, he says at this time it's important to understand what the conclusion of this theorem says. Okay, note also that there is static energy. This is, for instance, the mc squared energy due to the atomic nature of matter, 
and there is also the energy due to like chemical bonds whether broken or formed, okay? And we call this static because they tend not to change as you change the temperature or the volume of the pressure. Obviously, if you're uh, at a temperature, pressure, volume and such where you'll see a chemical reaction, you'll see some of the energy being stored in that chemical reaction. How do you count the number of degrees of freedom? This is more of an art than a science, at least at this point for you. Um, and thanks to quantum mechanics, sometimes there are degrees of freedom that you can't use because they're not accessible at that energy level. How do I explain this? Well, if you understand like how like a hydrogen atom behaves, right? So the electron has to either be in one state or the other state, and there's a certain amount of energy that's required to go from this state to that state. If there's not that, that much energy in the system, then you don't have to consider this a degree of freedom because it can never be reached, or it typically isn't reached, okay? So for monatomic particles, For monatomic gases, your degrees of freedom is three. That's because according to quantum mechanics, these things don't rotate and they only have kinetic energy in the three basic directions, okay? For diatomic mono molecules, you're gonna have two additional degrees of freedom because of the rotational nature of their shape. So F is going to equal five. So if you have O2, for instance, it won't rotate around on this axis, but in the other axes, it can rotate around those axes. Okay, so we have to count those two additional degrees of freedom. Now, we could count the degree of freedom for those two atoms oscillating against each other. However, according to quantum mechanics, at the temperatures and pressures that we're used to dealing with, that typically doesn't happen. However, at high temperatures, uh, very high pressures, you might see that that might become an important issue. Okay. This is also true for molecules like CO2 where they're linear, they're aligned in a line, okay? And then you have other molecules that don't follow the linear shape and those are gonna have additional degrees of freedom because of how they can rotate. Like for instance, if we were to take a water molecule, which looks like Mickey Mouse, right? So we have this axis, this axis, and this axis, and it can rotate about any of those three axes. So that's three degrees of freedom just for those rotational axes, okay? You might wonder why it is that the same amount of energy that's stored in the translational degrees of freedom is stored in the rotational degrees of freedom. I don't have a good answer for this, not at this point at least. Okay, What you can imagine is that you're throwing and these knocking these molecules about, and in any interaction, the energy has to be transferred from one particle to the other. And so that energy could be coming from kinetic energy, it could be coming from the rotational energy, and it could be transferred to kinetic or rotational energy over time, well, very short time periods with large numbers of particles, you'll see that the energies will spread out evenly. Think of each of the degrees of freedom as like a box where you can store energy, uh, maybe like a cup, and the amount of energy in each of the cups has to be the same. In a solid, each atom can vibrate in three perpendicular directions. So when we have a solid, the best way to think of a solid is you have particles that are arranged in some crystal structure and there's these uh, forces between them, like springs that try to keep the particles staying still. And so in a solid, we have the three degrees of freedom due to kinetic energy. And we also have three more degrees of freedom for the potential energy as they um, get out of place. Like the lowest energy they'd have is in their position in the crystal, but if they're moving out of their place then there's gonna be energy stored in the potential energy, okay? And so this is pretty much true for all solids. There's six degrees of freedom for solids. Keep in mind that for some solids at some energy levels, because of quantum mechanics, these, these degrees of freedom might be frozen out. You couldn't reach them because there's not enough energy to reach them. Liquids are a lot more complex to describe. Let me actually draw a cue there. Liquids are a lot more complex to describe. We generally use three halves KT for the kinetic energy of the particles. But the equipartition theorem doesn't work for the rest of the energies that can be stored in a liquid. And the reason why is because those energies aren't quadratic. How can we test the equipartition theorem? Well, it's rather easy. You take a substance, you add some energy to it, like, and you see how much energy it takes to raise a temperature a certain amount. We're gonna cover more detail about how to do this experiment in section 1.6. Well, let's talk about the three problems. So there's only three problems here, 123, 124, and 125. 123 is asking you to calculate the thermal energy of a liter of helium at room temperature and atmospheric pressure. 
and then you do the same for a liter of air. Remember, air is composed of mostly nitrogen, some oxygen, and some argon. You can look up the proportions in an earlier section. So this should be fairly straightforward. Remember that argon is a monatomic molecule. It doesn't have multiple atoms. Problem 124, calculate the total thermal energy in a gram of lead at room temperature, assuming that none of the degrees of freedom are frozen out. So you just use F equals six for that. It's pretty easy to calculate. For problem 125, you can list all the degrees of freedom, or as many as you can think of, for a molecule of water vapor. And when you're doing water vapor, you need to think about how it can oscillate, right? There's many different ways that the atoms are pulled together and they form a shape. There's a reason why water is not like carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is like this, but water is more like this. There's an attraction between these two hydrogen atoms. And there's a repulsion as well, right? So there's many different ways this water atom can, this water molecule can oscillate. I want you to think about all of them. Anyway, guys, this is a fairly short section, not a lot of problems. It's a lot of talking. Uh, the equipartition theorem is an important theorem, but we're not deriving it here. We're not proving it here. We're just talking about it. So I hope you guys have a great day. Take care and bye-bye.